Today we have Neil with me. Uh, it's normally called the business tea, but obviously today it's too hot to drink tea, so I'm comforting myself with water. Do you have tea or what? what do you I have, have a, a very refreshing mint tea. Mint tea. Okay. So, you know, it, it is tea time, so I think we can uh, excuse, excuse that today that uh, tea and water. Yeah. 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 Uh, we met each other in Denver, Colorado. We did. Was that 2018? I think it was 2018. That's a great question. Um, it probably was, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah, I think in 2019 we went to Japan for the Rugby World Cup. Yeah, true. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that October. And then it was the October, the fall, as they say in the States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. year before it was Denver, yeah. Well, yeah, like exactly. Two and a half years ago, yeah, we were at a yeah, summit. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. And we met at the Scale Up Summit, uh, which is obviously one of the of conferences run by Vern Harnish, the author of the Scale Up book, which is one of the best business books ever. Uh, and uh, the reason why I went there was because we as a company like plateaued. We, we were growing and then suddenly we just couldn't find direction. And it's thanks to Neil that we sort of regained our purpose. Uh, but we'll talk about that a bit later. So Neil, how did you get into coaching? It's a really good question. I was for many years working in the hospitality industry, um, which is again based around here, Bass, Bass Brewers, uh, founded in 1777 in a town just up the road from here in Burton on Trent, and I worked there for 20 years mm -hmm. and uh, took redundancy um, back in 2007. Interestingly, um, like a lot of organisations, uh, ultimately was working for a boss, so just didn't get on with. So, um, reason for, for, for moving on, but actually. It suited me very well because, um, you know, a bit like you said, as a business, you plateau. I think as humans, we tend to plateau as well. I wasn't progressing, wasn't going to make the board there. I was comfortable with that. So I uh, took redundancy and coaching found me. And mm -hmm. uh, someone said, Neil, do you make a good coach? And I said, well, what does a coach do? I knew what they did on the, on the football pitch, but, you know, what does a business coach do? And they explained a bit more about how business coaches, same sort of thing, really help get companies fit to, to play out really well and But was that directly with Gazelles as they were called? No, called, no, I'd, no, I'd spent some time in 2008 doing some other coaching qualifications and uh, it was a few years later that my coach at the time, Chuck, uh, suggested if I ever wanted to work with mid-market companies hmm. that this Gazelles methodology would be a very good good thing to look at. So uh, yeah, I went over to Barcelona, met up with Vern um, so he used history. to live there. Uh, was he that, did used to live there. That's right. Yeah, and, and he was delivering a, a conference uh, out in Barcelona at the time. Met up with him again. Really liked the the whole of the IP and, and, and the, the material and and that. Just wasn't quite the right time then. Um, what but, resonated like most with you with with the whole methodology? Well, I think two things. One is it's very easy for people to to be able to get their heads around, and if you, it's easy to help people implement, that's more likely they're going to be successful with it. And then with that ease came practical as well. I think you know, the tools that we use with yourselves are very practical. They you can you can get on to work with them straight away um, and almost see the fruits of your labor, the, what you've done almost straight away if you apply it the right way. So that, that was very attractive. Um, and the fact that it allowed me then to start working with more mid-market companies and uh, you know, it's the mid-market organizations like Stilo that are well, the drivers we of small growth. Markets. I thought we were still small. <laughs> well yeah, but you know I think you know, you at some stage you, you, you move from being a real sort of startup and I think the fact that you have progressed from being a startup, you you may still be small, but you need to have some sort of methodology to move on from that small business to the way a small business thinks to a way that mid-market or large business thinks and having to bring in a sense of culture, have to bring in a set of values, have to get really clear about what your purpose is. Those are things that as you start graduating from just being a startup, you need to get more, more focused in on. So those are all areas that we were able to sort of bring in to, yeah. to the coaching practice. Yeah. And because you've worked with so many companies now, what are the sort of biggest mistakes that you can straight away see that, okay, well, these companies will struggle because they're making this mistake? Well, I think there's a number of things. I, it's not just the company that makes mistakes, but it's often the entrepreneur. So let's start with I the entrepreneur. it's always the entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you, the, 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 the type of character, the type of characteristics you need to, to, the energy you need to set up a company, get it moving, 
aren't necessarily always the same things that you need to have when you start bringing a team on board. You need to start be able to get on with people. So you often find that those people who are brilliant at taking risks, brilliant at uh, the energy and the drive and the competitiveness to get a company started aren't necessarily so good at taking it to that next level because they don't get on with people. You know, they, there's a very different set of, of, of things. So they then help them to rationalize that and to say, look, you're probably good at being the founder and, and doing those things well, but if you really want to grow, then you mean bring someone else on board who's going to really take care of the people side of things. So I think that's one thing um, that, that, that's a challenge. I think secondly, when you first start out, you kind of have something that feels like a, a plan, but then as you graduate, you then need to have much more clarity on your strategy. And I think that's where people come and stuck often is that they don't have a clear strategy and an alignment around it. Thirdly, I think it's all about people. I think, again, you know, one of the challenges of being able to hire the right people. And I think that's probably because none of us ever get taught. There's no, not really something that's on the curriculum at university, how to go and hire great talent. You just learn by mistakes and uh, faults and stuff like that. Isn't that book the best book about recruitment? 100%. <laughs> Who? Yeah, I mean, more often, probably one of the last coaching sessions I must be doing around that was, was all to do about, you know, top grading as, as Jeff talks about and making sure that rather than picking it to chance of bringing the right people on and more for not making a mistake and having to start again, having a robust, robust process to allow you to be more certain that if you follow that, you're going to bring in the people who not only are going to be right for the organization, um, be able to do the job that they've been employed to do, but also have a good cultural fit as it were. So I think that's a key area. And then the other thing is, is you, as you scale up, um, there's always a danger of, of running out of cash. Um, and growth, Vern quotes it many times, growth sucks cash. Now, you, you know, that, that feels like that r sort of law of entrepreneurial gravity. You know, well, wh why is that? You know, we're, we're growing revenues and all those things. Yes, you are. But as you know, then you need to be investing in maybe a larger factory. You need to invest in more plant, more people, more new systems suddenly you find you're investing in all these things and then that uh, unless you've got a really good eye on it you're, you're in danger of you know, growing broke and uh, so i think that's the important thing of helping people understand the importance of financial literacy um, when you start scaling up yeah and that's also part of the scale up book which is also nicely displayed over there because uh, it's broken down into four sections and the last or fourth category is about cash and how to maintain it and it is it was co-written by what's his, his name he's so passionate when on stage he was well, different alan milts <laughs> alan milts <laughs> yeah yeah is uh yeah I mean, alan is a genius when it comes to things around cash um but unlike a lot of uh accountants he is someone who brings a huge amount of energy yeah. to his topic yeah, yeah. um yeah. so much so that you probably never really want to follow alan um as a keynote, and we've done a lot together because by the time he's been on stage for three hours, nobody's got any bandwidth to take anything more information in whatsoever. It's like, I'm done. So, uh, but he, again, he just gives you really good structure to understand numbers. And I think where most businesses, and I think he uses this phrase that, you know, entrepreneurs and accountants speak Spanish and the banks speak Portuguese, which is a really good way of looking at it because you're kind of, almost speaking the same thing, but actually in reality, unless you can speak the language of, of sort of accountancy, it's going to be really difficult to grow into business. And I think he uses that um, example of William, William Plummers in the, in the book, who William thinks he's doing really well, and then, but is only really looking at the revenue line and profit line, and then realizes that the balance sheet is where it's kind of the, 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 the story of your business success is, 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 is in the balance sheet, as it were. Do you find capital. that many business owners are like way behind with the numbers where they just continue focusing on the businesses and without even checking the numbers? I think it's a blind spot for a lot of people. Um, it really is. Um, and again, because I think we're conditioned to always being sort of focused on the P&L line. How's, how's business? Oh, it's great. You know, revenues are growing by such and such and profitability is looking quite good. You don't very often get questioned around your working capital position 
or your balance sheet or health, your cash reserves are. So you can kind of get away with it until the bank, who the only thing they're interested in is necessarily is the, the balance sheet, your ability to repay their loan and stuff like that. So yeah, for a lot of people, it's, it, is, it is a blind spot. And I think as well, it's a difficult one because you know, when you're a small business, you, you have a bookkeeper or something like that, and uh, you'd be able to do things on you know, a system like Sage. Um, and then as you grow out, you at some stage need to have a more financial resource, but that becomes expensive. You know, hiring an FD can you know, cost up to 100K. But you're, when you're in that space between sort of 6 million and 10 million, it's difficult to justify having an FD on board. And I think that's a struggle a lot of people don't have is, well, accountants, we're just about outgrowing our accountant now, but we can't afford to have that, that the FD. Yeah, yeah, which is roughly where we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah well, and, and the same for a sales director as well, by the way. Yeah. You know, again, that, that sort of difficult position you go yeah, through. Because as you know, we did try, but that didn't work out whatsoever. It obviously cost us a lot. And then yeah. we back to square one. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably the hardest hire any business to make as a sales director. And even then they kind of, you bring top grading in. Sales director is able to, you know, sell you, you know, for half decent, you know, oil, oil to the Arabs as it were. But, you know, then find out that, uh, you know, the, the, the gift of the, you know, the, what they're, they're able to talk themselves is didn't always bear itself out in practice. Yeah. And that's such a challenge to be able to find really good sales, yeah. sales yeah. resource. But don't you think that at any stage of growth is always the case where you're still too small for something? but too big or you've outgrown the previous thing. Because I, I sort of know that when I help other people, when they start their business, they reach a point where they work in crazy hours, but they don't have the resources available to employ the first employee. And then yeah. I know then based on growth, when we were moving from our smaller space to the larger one, it was such a massive sort of stretch yeah. for us. Like, can, can we afford it? Yeah. So and of course you're a student of Michael Gerber and, and then that, that whole e-myth teaches us yeah. the whole sort of uh, way of, you know, starting then to draw out, you know, sort of, I think as an architect, your business, what does the future structure look like, you know, in a few years time, and then what's the next hire that you can afford to make? Yeah. So you then start sort of doing yourself out of the job. We use the functional accountability chart um, to help get down all the key functions that the organization needs to have. And obviously, when you first start out, you find out as a founder that your name is in pretty much all of those boxes then, but you need to figure out, okay, what's the next important hire? Yeah. Um, because you, if you're gonna grow out, you can't do everything yourself. You need to then figure out what's the next hire, and then the next hire, or if you've got gaps, what are they? Where are you being hurt right now? So you often find out that, uh, and, and I think it's probably gonna be a challenge for a lot of businesses we start growing quickly again, is the marketing role. That m a lot of businesses don't see the need or have a view around the importance of having a marketing role. But that can then hurt them Massively, when you look to say, you know, well, we need to grow out 20% or whatever it is, yeah. well, you need to get good at marketing then. So th finding somebody who's going to be able to do that uh, as opposed to just you know, lying on the CEO's or the founder's shoulders. Yeah, yeah. And what's your sort of biggest success story when helping others? Well, I think for me, the key area that I've always been focused on is, 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 is one metric is around job creation. So I take the most pride when I see a, a client or a company I work with creating tens of jobs or sometimes even hundreds of jobs. And one of the companies that they were on the master's program with yourself from Exponia, um, you know, they were both in the uh, Slovakia and in, in London. And I think they, in short time working with them, um, you know, brought on about 300 employees, which is wow. phenomenal. I mean, that was very, you know, in the fastest, I think for a while, Peter was one of the, the fastest, if not the fastest growing SaaS organization in Europe. So, you know, to be able to, to help job creation and uh, so one of the metrics we have is one of our KPIs is how many jobs we created okay. through um, the organization. Because I think by doing that, um, you are, you know, helping economies, you're helping business, you're helping lots of people, you know, finding families meaningful work. And, yeah. Families, exactly. Um, and it's, it's, it, we talk about it all the time. It's we, and more importantly now than ever, Vern and I will talk about it in terms of the scale that's been the first responders to an economy you know, sort of uh, return to health. So we think that by focusing on scale ups in a city or in a region, it makes a lot of sense because they're the ones who are going to start creating jobs pretty quickly again. If you invest a lot in startups, yeah, they're required, 
but they may create two or three jobs, whereas a really successful scale-up could create 200, 300 yeah. jobs um, around that. So Yeah, and then being a coach, obviously you get paid for your help, but don't you sometimes regret not being like part of the business that suddenly explodes? Yeah, sometimes. I think maybe it's a model we'll look at in the future is taking some equity if people want to do that. It's always, I mean, that's the model that PE houses work on and, you know, venture capitalists work on and stuff like that is taking a bit of equity out. Um, and I think that then does give you some skin in the game. Um, you have to believe in someone then. So I think it's, it's something I haven't really done hitherto. Mm. But I think it's something that as you get more confident as a coach yeah. and your ability, because when a business is first starts out, they've probably got the most need for coaching and help, but they've got empty pockets when it comes to the resources yeah. to do that. So I think if you can then come up with a perspective that says, right, what we'll do is uh, take some equity um, in that. Even on a contingency basis, because if you believe in, in your support, then it just, yeah, if, if it works out, then you get some stake in the business. Yeah, you, you, exactly. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, I think as you grow out as a coach, then you have more confidence to do that and you confidence your own ability, you know, you get results and then do that. Um, I've kind of built into some of my contracts a, um, a profit sort of thing for the end. If we hit some targets we set down, if you if we hit X point targets yeah. or we hit some sort of net profit goals, then there is an extra uh, amount that comes in, which is quite a nice way of, of uh, being rewarded for success. And I think, again, you see in sport and stuff like that, you know, if, if the team that wins, you know, based on results, yeah. based on results, you know, they're going to get higher payout, you know, and same in motor racing, you know, whichever Grand Prix or wins and stuff like that, they get more money yeah. uh, around that. So I think that, so you asked me a few minutes ago about, you know, success factors and jobs is one, but I think again, being able to see businesses successfully grow out and then achieve their uh, buyout goals. That's another very, very uh, rewarding uh, situation to be, to see that you know, they've been there as part of the journey. They had a number in their mind that they wanted to achieve as their magic Buyout number. meaning selling yeah. their, their business. Yeah, exactly that. Exiting. Yeah, yeah so sort of a successful exit and they, yeah. they've achieved their magic number, whatever they had in mind. And know that you've been some small part of that uh, is, is, is rewarding. But you know, I think that, that notion of being very clear about what success looks like at the beginning of a coaching engagement. So it, it, often in year one, success is just putting in place some of the things like, you know, they got core values, have they got clarity on their core purpose like you and I worked on? Is there a you know, good one-page plan in place? Have we got the right people on the bus? But I think if you then progress a coaching relationship for a number of years, then you can then start to say, okay, well, let's put some real metrics in place that as we grow out, know that we're doing the right thing. So I've just got a new new client just started working with in London and we've just done that uh, almost a scorecard that have in there. I've got a coach's scorecard and that's what I'll be judged against. You know, we've achieved these these certain goals or milestones. But are you judged by yourself or is there a Vern that judges you or is there like no, a No, well, I suppose in, in many respects, um, we, unlike some of the other coaching organizations I've been in, there is, there's not a transparency of each other's metrics. I've been in some coaching organizations where everyone can see each other's revenues and how successful they are, how many clients they've got and all these things. We don't have that so much in the scaling up community. Um, so I think more of it, the success is what you input into the community, what you input into um, the, the, the work with your clients. Um, so for me, the fact that I lead the sort of the Scaling Up Masters program globally, um, having a leadership role within the Scaling Up Coaching yeah. Organization, I sit on the advisory board. Because you mentioned your team is growing. So yes, know. yeah, and you know, we've got, um, we'll probably in the next few months have six associates um, in the practice as well. Um, so yeah, we've grown out a lot. We, we've done, um, Pivoted quite a lot over the last, even the last six, seven months. We, um, the government put a lot of money into the peer network program, and we've been delivering well up to the end of March, 15 cohorts, and we're just starting to deliver more of those as well now. So yeah, that's that's been quite a change, bringing more team members on board. Um, so you'll have to have your own one-page plan for your own 
coaching business. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I have that. Uh, and we have one for the Scaling Up Masters program as well. So I think it's important to be congruent, Michael. I think when you, when you are a successful coach, that you are using your own tools and you're, you're doing those things because, and, and you know, be successful as a, an entrepreneur. I mean, we've scaled up our coaching practice year on year. I've had a few dips and, and it, for a number of reasons, but the value actually, of deaths as Vern calls them. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the value values of death, but because I mean, we probably, well, we have. I mean, we just talked a few minutes ago about personal best. Our first quarter of 2021 was our very best quarter that we've ever had. And you think, well, that's in the middle of a pandemic, but we changed a few things. We're working more of these peer networks now and bringing more people on board. Um, and in the UK, there's a lot of focus now on scale ups. The Scale Up Institute. Even two weeks ago, Boris Johnson put out a little video um, advocating the importance of scale-ups to economies, and so we've latched onto that, obviously. And um, so, yeah, I think we'll see, like anyone does. You know, you, we talk about the importance of being able to spot trends in the market, um, like you did last year. You know, with the, with the pandemic, the trend, we'll come back to in a minute. But you know, we we see that this is a trend now that. You know, scale ups are very much sort of talked about by government, talked about by the economics. If you go even listen to Apprentice or you know the, all these things, the, the word scale up now seems to be the, a narrative you wouldn't have heard three or four years ago. Yeah. So we think we're in a good place you know, with the scaling up book, the scaling up dot com, and all those things that we've kind of, as Vern talks about, the words you own in the market. You want to make sure that people are looking for that support. You know that you're there, you're visible. Yeah, yeah. And how did the pandemic roll out for you? Because initially, I guess you did take a hit, and then. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I think that's right. A lot, of, a lot of people had to sort of um, make some really tough calls just over a year ago, and uh, I think it probably hit the manufacturing and engineering sector really hard f first up. And I think. You know, we, we, you could start seeing some of the uh, early signs, you know, the early warning signals back in March of last year that, you know, the order book wasn't looking quite robust, the confidence was, was falling away. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly things moved fairly quickly and you had to, you know, everyone had to take pretty dramatic efforts to close down sort of uh, unnecessary sort of investments and letting people go and, you know, really hard, wasn't it? You know, furloughing yeah. good people and, and, and those things and... Uh, but I, I think, think everyone was a bit in like panic mode because we were the same. We'd like, okay, now we have to furlough almost everyone. But after a few days, like, well, hang on a moment, we've got too much work now. We need to unfurlow. And yeah. actually, it didn't count because you had to furlough people for two weeks, I think the minimum was. Uh -huh. So we had to unfurlow them after a few days. Yeah. Which we then had to cover sort of the yeah. days they weren't working. Yeah. But yeah, that's a yeah. bit of a shock for us. Yeah. So I think, you know, probably this time last year, I was working, I was at full capacity, um, about 15 one on one clients. And, uh, went probably down to about eight. There was some I just couldn't get to in Ireland and uh, Italy. So, you know, they didn't necessarily want to do Zoom so much. Well, so that- Italy was one of the hotspots. It was, yeah. So it was a few that, you know, literally just uh, logistics were not allowing others um, who literally just had to fill the whole operation and pretty much sort of go into mothballs and stuff like that. But we're back up to probably about 10 one-on-one -on -one clients. And then we've got this focus on the, the peer networks as well now. Um, and bring your associates on board and then we are looking to the next SMP launch in October this year so that'll probably bring on another five one-on-one -on -one clients which won't take me that far off capacity again um, or giving more to some of the associates so again if I spend more time working globally with the Scaling Up Masters program probably eight or nine great one-to-one -one clients feels like a great place to be and then you've got the bandwidth to sort of think about growing this business out as well. So with COVID, did you have to change the way you worked with your customers? Hugely. Um, and you know, as you know, my, my, my model previously was to spend a day a week, sorry, a day a month with most clients. I think that was a, a time when you could really spend quality time and get really everyone focused around it. So uh, that, that involved traveling either first thing in the morning, um, working through the day and then traveling back back later or staying down for a few nights and stuff like that. So that all changed obviously straight away. Um, and that meant that we had to pretty quickly work out how to 
coach via Zoom or, or something like that, Teams and, and that, then he suddenly came to prominence. So yeah, changed the way we operate around here so that um, I had a stand-up desk pretty much quickly because I was really struggling with my back and you know things sat down all day looking down a Zoom camera. Um, and it was mentally fatiguing as well. I mean, I, I remember doing some full-day quarterly pl planning sessions or full-day training sessions um, and you might have seven or eight other people on the call and you've got to be in the present all the time. There's no, you know, getting away from that and uh, be concentrating the whole time. And, and literally, I was absolutely drained at the end of those days. It was literally just totally wiped out. And I think it just took a while to evolve to a place where you, you got more stamina around those days and stuff like that. But I think the other thing is what clients didn't realize that who hitherto said, no, we want you to come face to face as well, that you could actually coach and get results via Zoom. Um, and actually, there were other benefits by doing it. It meant that I think sometimes people who hitherto um, didn't find their voice in a boardroom um, would then suddenly be in a position where if you had them in a breakout room, they had to contribute. There's no getting away from it. And that was a real benefit. So, you know, I think we evolved. We had to, we had to evolve pretty quickly. Um, it wasn't my natural style. I'm, I'm, not, I'm a people person, so I'd much rather be face to face. But you had to, you had to get on with it and, and do it that but way. But moving forward, would you still go back to the old way of visiting companies or will you now stick to technology? No, I'm already returning now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you yeah, know, there's, it's, and I love it that way, you know, and, yeah. uh, you it's know, being back in. It's the it's energy, you're right, you know, and there's being good people and sparking off one another. And, you know, as humans, we're human beings. We exist by being with others, I think. Um, yeah, there are obviously some people who, their personality style is more suited to being task orientated and just being able to work remotely. Um, I know that I get my energy from being around people um, and, uh, and and that, that sort of two-way interaction that, that, go, that goes with it. So, uh, but I think, I think it will blend. I think um, I've just come off uh, the call with uh, an old client from Lebanon and they want to help out with 10 businesses who are in the um, renewable energy sector. Um, and no doubt I'll deliver that by Zoom. And uh, a couple of months ago, I did a whole program in Kuwait and, uh, and I wouldn't have been able to do that practically you know, without doing it down Zoom. So I think nowadays we're able to help businesses all over the world. You know, it isn't just limited to the UK. Um, it just means that I have to prepare for those in a slightly different way, um, but that's fine. Um, but we know we can get results that way as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, obviously, like with us, we are, I'm very thankful that Neil helped us in terms of finding out our purpose and the values and, and sort of making it more of a meaningful place to work. Uh, although with us, the steel business, as you know, is we, we, we slightly hit like a dead end. And me, myself, I'm more prone to like running other businesses and starting new businesses and so on. So that is sort of my direction. So that's why I wouldn't say Stilo is like an example of a scale up because it is limited. I mean, we, we serve a very sort of niche market yeah. in London and so on. So we would have to totally change the way we do business. And I don't really see it as a sort of uh, feasible model. Uh, but we're obviously working on other stuff and I, I really, really recommend Neil's sort of coaching, uh, his approach. He's a very, as you mentioned, a people's person. So Neil, what, what are the next steps if someone wants to sort of reach out to you and for you to coach them? Yeah, it's very straightforward. Um, what we'll do is give you some of the details on the uh, site to find in terms of... So uh, we'll be uh, in yeah, the comments. In, in, in the comments yeah. box around that. I think that's the easiest, easiest way you'll find me very approachable. What I like to do is, is really get to know, like you and I did in terms of we had some time in Denver to get to know each other and we met up in London to make sure we're a good fit. You know, I think it goes yeah. two ways. You want to make sure, like you did, you did diligence with myself. Was I going to be a good coach for yeah. you? Did I seem yeah. to have the credibility? Um, did I have the tools with that? And equally, I'm looking for a client that I can enjoy coaching um, and get energy from, and, and they're going to take on board what we've we've taught. So I think that's, that's the sort of process we, we go through. And then if we find out we're a good fit, mm -hmm. then when we then figure out what's the right program, and you came onto the Scaly Up Masters program. Um, so what programs which, do you offer? So we have one-to-one -one just coaching, um, which is where we you know, just ostensibly go through the whole of the curriculum 
um, that is scaling up probably over a 12 month period. The master's program actually is a nice add-on because that gives some great classroom tuition with five or six other companies and have some of our faculty members. You mentioned Alan, Vern yeah. came over to that one as well. So you've got the, the world class thought leaders yeah. in the room at the time. You're not just talking it theoretically, but they're helping you guide that through. So that's the Scaling Up Masters program. And then this peer networking. Um, we, I think that's the other area that we're going to look at more is, is giving opportunities of group coaching with, 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 with peers um, where you're with, let's say, 10 other CEOs, um, maybe non-competing or in some areas you may be competing, that's fine if they're okay with that. Um, and more affordable, but again, gives the ability to come together with like-minded people, sharing business challenges and using the power of the mastermind to get breakthroughs around that. Yeah. And obviously business is about success. So what is your overarching definition of success? God. Even Gosh. if it's personal, what, what yeah. do you define as a success? Yeah, I, I, th I think there's a number of things. I think you've got to be really clear on what your client sees as success and, and, and almost asking those questions in terms of if we've been working together for three or four years, what would your definition of success look like? If we took ourselves forward that, that, that time, you, what would you describe as, you know, envision what would great look like? And people might say, well, we've had a successful exit. That would be successful. People might say that we've grown from 10 million to 30 million. That would be really successful. People might say if we've innovated and you know, bought about a new category or something like that, that would be successful. So I think I'm very focused on what it is that you know, the entrepreneur or the business owner is, is really around that. And then if we achieve some of those milestones, that's successful. The second thing that we introduced, and, and I love doing this, because I think often if you can bring parallels from the sporting world into the business boardroom, then you're able to, you know, to get, give that uh, a, a, ability to to see success in a different way and we brought in the personal best board in, in, in every athlete will have some sort of personal best that their coach is, is holding them to and that coach will define success by the fact they've m moved from 100 meters in 11 seconds down to 9.9 .9 or whatever that will be great that'll be because you know, again that will be successful and then i guess more success will be picking up a gold medal at the Olympics would be you know, huge success around that. So having real clarity around what a personal best looks like and then coaching to improve that. What do we need to do if we want to get if your business more X points or for most other businesses improvement on net profit, have, you know, what are the things we've got to work on in order to get those things achieved? And then that brings about improved performance, maybe better Great productivity, getting the right people on board, whole raft of things you begin working to in order to achieve that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, what I could also add is that if you are a business that is sort of already an established business and you want to make it to the next level, then Neil with the Scale Up program is definitely the man to, to approach. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much and, and keep scaling as, as Vern says. <laughs> yeah, definitely, I think now is more important than ever um to have that mindset yeah. um even even if you are starting out is have an envision that one day you are going to be scaling up and that's why i think scaling up with regardless if you start up or you know, you're established is a wonderful book to read because it gives you that mindset and it gives you that sort of which is framework. that book over there it yeah. is yeah well, and I'll, I'll, I'll add it to best, the description best tip well, yeah you you can have it's uh leaders are readers and there's no getting away from that, that uh, if you want to progress, uh, you have to have a curious mind. Uh, I think, um, as Carol Dweck says so poignantly, having a growth mindset, you know, and, uh, and, and if you've got those two facets and uh, I'd say that curiosity about how things can be embedded, how, how you can improve yourself and the desire to keep aren't growing. Aren't entrepreneurs curious, like by design, like aren't they hardwired with curiosity? Some are. But I wouldn't say everyone is. I think, no? okay. um, and yeah, there is often a problem to be solved. Um, and but often entrepreneurs, I think, get into it for the wrong reason. That they just think it's a way to making money. Yeah, yeah. True. So if you think I'm going to become a, an entrepreneur one day, I've had it with my career or stuff like that. 
you don't necessarily always have the need curiosity that you're going to need to be successful. You can be an entrepreneur, but but you, would you still call them entrepreneurs if they're just in it for the money? No, I don't think so. I think yeah. they'd be business people. Yeah. Yeah, for certain, there's a lot of people. Yeah, it's great, you know, who are pretty good business people. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got, you know, not always, from my perspective, the right motives and stuff like that. Um, but if you have a deep, deep desire to improve the world, to to come up with things that are going to make it easier uh, for people to um, solve their problems, or you've found a way of just making you know things more straightforward. And there's a bubble to be made on it. That that that's great. But yeah, having and as Carol talks about, you know, you got she does very clearly talk the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And I know by experience, it's very difficult to coach people with a fixed mindset because of course they know it all, and you know, I'm going to read and like that, and they they kind of already know everything, and they've got a, a clear path the way the world works, and uh, that'll take them so far, and then they'll get frustrated because they'll hit that value yeah. death. That you talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.